Inferno number three is the biggest and best of Jonathan Hickman's Inferno so far, with huge reveals and intrigue that will propel X-Men comics forward in 2022. Simply put, as we face a future with only one more issue of Hickman written X-Men in Inferno number four, this event here delivers the most exciting new story I've seen from the X-Men line in months. Today I'll answer... What is the secret of the Omega Sentinel, and what does it mean for X-Men comics going forward? What is the secret of Doug Ramsey, Warlock, and Krakoa? How is Inferno going to end? Hey everybody, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You're listening to Cracking Krakoa number 205 in Inferno number 3 review. If you like the CBH YouTube channel, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, and commenting. It all helps me out a great deal. Casual Krakoa will be live today, the day Inferno number 3 was released in the evening, circa 515 Central Standard Time. I'll try to include a link here in the show notes. Otherwise, of course, just like and subscribe to the channel, and you'll see when I'm going live here on today's Casual Krakoa. We have so much to talk about with what is going on in the world of X-Men. Spoilers for discuss comics will follow writer jonathan hickman artist rb silva stefano caselli valerio shidi inks by adriano d benedito colors by david curiel so after inferno number two i explored the idea that omega sentinel the former karima shepinder was hiding in plain sight as the key figure in orcus and inferno number three confirms that in some momentous ways we begin with the third consecutive omega sentinel epitaph i know something far more valuable a different history of the world since the role of Omega Sentinel in this story is easily the biggest reveal and the clearest indicator of where Hickman's X-Men setup is going, heading into 2022's Destiny of X, I'll frame the story around it. Again, spoilers if you haven't read, because this is a big reveal issue. The major reveal here occurs in the back half of Inferno number 3, with Omega Sentinel and Nimrod talking aboard at the Orcus facility as the Mother Mold is rebuilt near the sun, flying in the face of mutant kind's impassioned no more from House of X number 4. And what is revealed is that Omega Sentinel is not only the brains behind Orcus, but a time-traveling Sentinel consciousness. This Omega Sentinel is from the future, where mutants always win, and the Omega's been sent back to prevent this future from coming to pass. Does this sound familiar? It should. It's very much the basis of Days of Future Past, but inverted. The Omega Sentinel reveal, while I was tapped into the import of Karima after the first half of Inferno, I definitely wasn't predicting this particular direction. Again, this heavily Days of Future Past influenced time travel story instead of Omega Sentinel traveling through Moira's lifelines, although given the use of a black hole here as a travel device, that thread still lingers with Rasputin, Zorn, and Omega Sentinel from Powers of Ten. And I do just want to give credit where it's due to Hickman and team here for pulling off a move like this with all the predictive engines and theorizing fans like myself do, and to sit Omega Sentinel right before our eyes the whole time. It's flipping brilliant. I love it. I love it. I love it. What a turn. The incredible irony of Omega's reveal is that Moira's hox pox assertion that we always lose is here inverted from the machine perspective, where mutant ascendancy is an unavoidable certainty. Moira's 10th life plan actually works. Mutants always win. They did it. So we get teases of how mutant victory plays out. The children of the vault emerge, but are beaten by a mutant human alliance, and importantly, the return of Apocalypse and family from Amenth. Now, despite this human mutant alliance against the children, humanity still builds the first, lesser Nimrod, the one we've read in the Claremont era, I think. I definitely haven't run quality assurance yet on how the continuity plays out with all of the various Nimrods and the timey wimey shenanigans. Cooler still, mutants go on to rule the soul system. Humans and machines are defeated. Here, a quote. Using the Phoenix Blade, the child of the sun, they destroyed Titan after Titan, Dominion after Dominion, and ended the machine future forever. I mean, I will say here, this stuff rules. I love it. It's some of my favorite parts connecting the dots to Powers of Ten. I would have liked to have seen these types of futures in the structural build to this point, whether in Hickman, X-Men, or elsewhere throughout the Dawn of X, and obviously it's still sitting out there as something that can be done. But nonetheless, in this future where mutants always win, a trickster titan, okay, like in a, in a system, a titan, sends Omega Sentinel's mind back through a black hole, and with that knowledge... Omega Sentinel has been founding Orcus, controlling Director Devo, orchestrating the building of Nimrod, and it was Omega all along. Q Agatha all along soundtrack. Like Moira's Lifeline infographics before, we get the Omega Sentinel history broken now into timelines. 
all within Moira's tent life. The biggest reveals here are the future stories, the taming of the Phoenix, the Rookshire Blade, Dominion Hunt, that sort of thing, which all sounds awesome and exciting, and I would love to see play out, although again, it is one of those things where just teasing it is exciting enough. Now, the timeline takes care to make it so Nimrod, or a Nimrod, still takes part in the 80s Chris Claremont written stories, right? It goes out of its way to say here, okay, time travel is involved, there was a lesser Nimrod that was created in this future where mutant always win, that's the one that got sent back and defeated, you know, by the likes of Harry Leland, by the likes of, uh, you know, we saw Rogue back in those 80s Claremont written issues. Uh, that's not the Nimrod we're dealing with here, okay? This Nimrod is better, stronger, faster, harder. Now, most of the information here is a part of House of X Powers of 10 and the Hickman X verse to date, but one question newer readers may wonder is what is the Phoenix Blade? Okay, it's teased here pretty prominently. And this is actually something I covered back in the 10 of Swords hype days, were we ever so young? When I was theorizing Swords, that could play a role in that event. The Blade debuts in the Uncanny X-Men run by Ed Brubaker and Billy Tan. You'll want to check out the rise and fall of the Shi'ar Empire story starting in Uncanny X-Men number 479 to learn the full story of Rookshire, his connection to the Phoenix, and his family's legacy with this blade. Long story short, it's a weapon imbued with the power of the Phoenix that can only be wielded by those with a connection to the Phoenix Force. The way the future image was teased, I read Hickman's future as one where Sunspot was wielding the blade, but perhaps we'll see Corvus Rookshire return. Of course, it is just endless, endless possibility. So... Omega Sentinel's reveal here is interesting too, because not only did Moira and Mutant Kind's gambit to destroy Nimrod fail, but it was working against Omega's gambit to bring a Nimrod Prime online ahead of schedule. So you have Moira using lifeline histories to prevent Nimrod, and Omega using the future to bring Nimrod online earlier and better. And the Omega Sentinel won. I've wondered aloud about competing lifelines before. Hickman's pretty clearly inspired by Claire North's The First 15 Lives of Harry August, and that book follows two individuals who can relive lives. In fact, there's a whole community of people with that ability. But this is a clever way of mirroring that with slight alterations, right? You have Moira living her lifelines. You have the Omega Sentinel doing a, a relatively, by comparison, more standard version of time travel. So what does all this mean for the future of mutants and where 2022's Destiny of X is heading? Well, we already knew 2022 was going to be time travel heavy based on the teasers for early uh, next year's 10 week, 10 lives, 10 deaths of Wolverine, X lives, X deaths, weekly event series written by Benjamin Percy. Likewise, the teaser promos for the next era of X-Men comics, the Destiny of X, have promised that there is no one destiny for mutant kind, okay, with images oscillating outcomes across timelines and realities for various X-Men characters, which personally I find very exciting. So every indication here is that where once Moira's lifelines merely extended horizontally, one on top of the other, now we're going to see Moira's 10th life splinter vertically, okay, into timelines A, B, C, etc. It's going to get timey-wimey, weird, wild, and I am so here for it. For just one example, if Omega Sentinel's secret is revealed to mutant kind, that could be the assassination a time-traveling Wolverine needs to carry out in X Lives X Deaths in order to make sure mutants always win, right? They want that future to come to pass, or at least I would imagine they should. And it's this potentially endless cycle of days of future pasting all over the place, trying to make sure various outcomes happen the way mutants and machines want, that could get messy and weird and Honestly, pretty fun. <laughs> I kind of like it. Inferno number three also does a nice job deflecting the fact that we still don't really know why Moira is so terrified of Destiny, knowing what her plans are for mutant kind. Okay, that was the number one answer I wanted to get out of this issue. It is decidedly not here. Because if we just follow Omega Sentinel's timeline, I mean, what's the problem <laughs> with that mutant ascendancy, right? Maybe the human mutant war? Right? Maybe the fact that, okay, it seems like uh, mutants, after all, did wipe out humanity. That's definitely going to rub some mutants in this era the wrong way. Is that what Moira was plotting? Is it as simple, as simple as just sort of declaring humans and mutants cannot get along? We do actually need to wipe them out? I mean, that could work, honestly. Like, that is such a, a central part of X-Men through the years that that could be it. But we don't have that answer. We do not have confirmation on what Myra's actually planning and what she's actually afraid of. So elsewhere in Inferno number three, there are effectively two major threads being explored. Inferno number three opens with a look back at Doug's time getting to know Krakoa and his secrets with Warlock and the island. There have been a lot of theories since Warlock's integration with Krakoa was teased back in House of X and Powers of Ten, and the answer here seems to be less insidious than often theorized. So as expected, Warlock and Krakoa are integrated, apparently by kind of eating each other, but sure, it's comics. I love that early in the process here, Doug calls 
calls out Professor X's intensely rocky history hard. He says here, you know, oh, he's just leaving me hanging, just like that time, you know, everything will be okay, just like that time you died while I was in space having sex with a bird lady that are uh, imitating Professor X, which is exactly what happened, right? Professor X bails on the New Mutants kids in the 80s to go hang out with Lelandra and the Shi'ar. It's hilarious and true. And we have this exchange here between Doug and Warlock. The Professor has plans. Tell me, Warlock, do we trust him? And Warlock, of course, says, no cell friend. Experience says that we do not. Charlie does not tra- have the trust of his students here, uh, and, and he doesn't deserve it. He hasn't earned it yet. So Doug, Warlock, and Krakoa actually create no spaces, too. They aren't just these accidents, right? They aren't just these self-occurring things that exist on Krakoa that Moira discovers, and Doug gives it to them purposely, them being, you know, the, the trio of Moira, Mags, and Professor, because they don't know Warlock will know what they're doing. They don't know Warlock can access the no space, and that way, Doug, Krakoa, Warlock, they know all the secrets, okay? They know everything Moira, Magneto, and Professor X are planning in secret. They built it in, right? It's a redundancy so they can keep tabs on that because Doug knows they're gonna have secrets. So we see Doug overhearing Moira wanting Destiny Burn from existence in front of a very techno-organic looking Krakoa. And the question that remains here is what is Team Kruduglock going to do? about that. Well, I don't think it's an accident that Doug asks twice in this issue how Krakoa feels about mutants living on this sacred sentient land. As the only mutant, apart from Warlock, capable of real speech with Krakoa, Doug has a vested interest in treating the island not only like a sentient being, but like a friend. And I think what we're going to see here is that Doug can tell Moira Magneto and Professor X's secrets have spiraled out of control. That when you have Moira advocating the permanent death of a mutant in a mutant paradise that has conquered death, the experiment has failed. So Doug can tell in order to retain this beneficial mutant paradise to keep Krakoa thriving and his friends thriving, the council has to be ended or changed, or their role on it has to change drastically. And that it's time for mutants to learn about Moira. Now, I anticipate Doug will be the catalyst for this change and not Emma, Mystique, or Destiny, who are more interested in their own schemes and power plays. And we see hints of this being borne out already today. Again, the day Inferno number three is coming out. We also get a tease here, the announcement of Immortal X-Men. It's going to be written by Kieran Gillen with art by Lucas Wernick. I cannot wait. It's going to be a quiet council-centric book. But you'll note in the teaser promo and in the, in the, in the text, who's missing? Who's missing from this photo? No Magneto, no Doug. Krakoa? We'll see. We'll see. Changes our foot. So, elsewhere in the issue, Emma summons Mystique and Destiny to the White Palace and reveals to them what she's learned about Moira McTaggart. It's interesting to me here that Mystique and Destiny appear to be finding out about Moira for the first time, which is not how I imagine this playing out. I kind of uh, was picturing this where, because Moira is so terrified of Destiny, and because Destiny had said, hey, if you're doing weird stuff <laughs> when I come back to life, I'll find you out and I'll end you, um, it, Destiny doesn't seem to know, right? They seem to be finding out in real time here as Emma shares with them Moira's great secret. Now, as Emma tells her this, like, she's still not allied with Mystique and Destiny, okay? There's not, like, Team Emma, Mystique, Destiny. She says even, I'll never be with you, but I'm not with them either, not anymore. Professor X and Magneto, their plan, their, their sort of scared panic plan to let Emma Frost know what's going on, to get her on their side, backfired about as hard <laughs> as it could have possibly backfired, which is kind of the story, the moral of the story here going on with Mags. And Chuck Daddy, in some probable foreshadowing, Magneto and Chuck Wagon are discussing the lingering fear that they always lose, right? That the only way to win is to wipe out humanity and the threat of machines they help develop. I kind of anticipate this is going to be relevant, okay? I'm Again, I'm increasingly thinking this is, in fact, going to be Moira's grand secret. Now, Magneto also recognizes here, as they talk about this, that they have clearly lost their control of Krakoa, okay? Like, we know that. <laughs> We've been reading these comics. Professor X still can't admit it, okay? Emma has absolutely lost faith in them, despite Charles's, you know, his, his continued bluster or blinders saying, we still have control. <laughs> you do not, Professor Charles Xavier. Moira, she's captured by Orcus wandering the streets. Uh, Orcus not wandering, she was. <laughs> Just recklessly out and about. Orcus takes her away. Professor X Magneto set out to rescue her. Now, when Magneto and the Professor get to Terra Verde, where they have tracked Moira, remember they snuck a tracker into her, they find the Orcus agents already annihilated. 
Now, uh, one thing I wasn't clear about from the scene is, is this just Destiny and Mystique together, like being total bad A-words? Or is this the impact of Emma's mystery gift, likely the black box that is teased in this? Is that what allows them such destruction of the Orcus facility? Um, that'd be fine. I kind of like the idea of Mystique and Destiny just laying waste to baddies. <laughs> just being awesome at that. That actually sounds really fun. But nonetheless, Magneto and Professor X, they find only Moira's arm. Destiny and Mystique have the rest of her in a no place, and Professor and Magneto are set up now for a showdown with Nimrod, Omega, and Orcus. The trap that Mystique and Destiny have laid for them, they are basically saying, it's our time, <laughs> okay? Here's a Nimrod, here's an Omega Sentinel, here's Orcus, have fun, Professor X and Magneto, and that's uh, that's where we leave off, right? And given that Inferno number one began with the resurrection of Magneto and Professor X, that we know that that is a thing that is coming, it sure seems likely we can guess how this fight ends. The Krakoan for the next issue reads Mystique. Inferno number three is a huge issue with huge reveals, and I'm very glad to see Hickman going out with big swings. There is huge stuff here I didn't really even touch on. Like the fact that apparently Beast created Krakoan drugs and requires very specific sets of cadavers that he prescribes to Doug Ramsey in order to like fertilize and grow them. Uh, given Beast hasn't done anything ethically sound since like the early 1990s, that's concerning. <laughs> that that feels like a problem. Also, where did Beast get these cadavers? One wonders. There are still big questions to answer, but combined with the hype building around the destiny of X and the post-Hickman era, I'm really pleased with the issue and where X-Men comics may be going. Like I said at the front, I'm hyped. This is the most excited I've been about X-Men comics in quite some time. Well done, Team Inferno number three. Com comic Book Herald is supported over at patreon.com slash comic book herald. You can provide support there. Any amount is greatly appreciated. I in particular want to thank everybody donating in the Mysterious Benefactors tier. Thank you, Jesse W., Megan Getman, Cole Weathers, Professor X3769, Richard Renz, Adam, Chris Murphicka, Bear Similitude, Terranort, Pinball Drew, Mike Solomons, Matt Mahoney, Joshua Bentley, and Alma. Thank you very much for your generous support. I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com, at comicbookherald on Twitter and Instagram. Look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more from me. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And as always, I'll see you at Casual Krakoa today and enjoy the comics. <laughs>